I mean, I mean, when you think about it, archaeology is nothing more than never out, oh, never outgrowing the sandbox stage in life, uh, which is what I do. Uh, so each day I wake up at 4.30 in the morning, I usually FaceTime my wife because she's still at night here in Lincoln, and then we begin to work. Uh, so it's a, it's a fun existence. Um, but it does take uh, pretty much every waking day of my life to make this happen. What I'm going to do is sort of tell you uh, what archaeology is like on the south coast of Turkey, uh, and also talk about, of course, our own particular site, so that it will give you an insight, I hope, into A, what archaeology is like, B, what the life of a Roman city was like, and also, um, you're going to see the uh, this this city, this, this ancient Roman city, come to life again, which had been buried for uh, now nearly two millennia. Now that we've begun working there, uh, this will be year 13 coming up. We're slowly peeling away the layers on, on this ancient city, and it's beginning to um, adjust. We're beginning to adjust our understanding of what this, uh, this place, what this uh, uh, region of Turkey was like in antiquity. So let's uh, let's get the ball rolling. Looks like I have to get closer to the thing. There we go. All right. Just so that you could see where we are located <coughs> on the map, I've circled the the location of the site. Uh, we are just due north of Cyprus, and in fact, if it's a clear day which it never is in the summer in Turkey. Uh, you can see Cyprus from the site. Um, so it is in a, a rather strategic location, especially for maritime traffic that is cruising along the northern shores of the Mediterranean from the very uh, wealthy and then, whoops, wrong button from the very wealthy uh, but older cultures of the Near East. Uh, also traffic coming up the, the coast of the Levant from Egypt uh, as it's making its way across to, the, uh, to Greece and then over to Italy. Practically everything has to cross right by our site. So it was a pretty well-trafficked area, you know, sort of like I-80 and just off I-80 would be New York. So this is like York, Nebraska, in many respects. Or Lincoln, you know, or, or any of these locations just off the one of the major arteries of the ancient world. But unlike I-80, the maritime location, especially in the second century BC, at a time where the old cultures of the Greek world were breaking down, that they were no longer as strong um, as they had been previously, and the Roman Empire really hadn't made too many incursions yet into the eastern Mediterranean that meant that this area was kind of rife with pirates who could prey upon the shipping of this um, of this corridor and that's exactly what happened and many of these pirates lived down in our region because it was extremely mountainous that they could run up into the hills and hide away from anybody who dared to go try to get them or uh, they could um, um, anchor their ships in these slipways, these, uh, these anchorages that were very well protected from detection. And so Cilicia became a very major haven for pirates, sort of synonymous with the pirates of the Caribbean. Even the term Cilician pirates in antiquity was probably, uh, would conjure up a, um, a, a sense of, of evilness that today the pirates of the Caribbean do, although there probably wasn't a Johnny Depp character. Uh, so here is what the landscape, or the seascape, I should say, 
looks like today. You can see the, the mountains come all the way down to the sea with these uh, these rocks that that jut out into the water, and here's that corridor. Cypress is right over there, so a a boat could hide very easily right here and then dart out and attack a ship as it's coming by. Um, and in fact, I've been finding, as I was trying to do some research on the Silician pirates, of course I, I found some. Uh, here's a collection of them in a museum in Britain. Well, and the Silician pirates became so important that they even have a video game that I discovered about the Silician pirates. Now, um, we are kind of celebrating here the Ides of March, and I think most of you will remember that the Ides of March were important primarily because it is the date usually associated with the assassination of Julius Caesar at the hands of Brutus Cassius in the Roman Senate. Um, and so it so happens that Julius Caesar, when he was uh, 25, uh, there it is. When he was 25 years old, he was kidnapped by the Silesian pirates and held for ransom. Uh, he was a cocky guy, Julius Caesar. Uh, when he, after he was captured by the pirates, he asked them, well, how much do you want for me? How much is my ransom? And they told him how much it was, and he was outraged. That's way too low. You gotta ask everybody for a lot more money. I'm worth a hell of a lot more. And they said, okay. And so he wired, or he didn't wire his friends, he contacted his friends and said, look, the Silesian pirates got me. You need to pony up all this money to get me out of pocket. Um, and so he, he was very happy with the, with the pirates. He played games with them. And in fact, he pretended to be their leader on occasion during the, the time that he was with them, which was probably a couple months. So eventually he was released by the pirates because they, they, they were paid. Uh, Caesar promptly went back to Rome. He mustered up an army and he came back to the site and he executed every single one of his former pi uh, pirate captors. Uh, so he really was a, an interesting character with respect to the Silesian pirates. Uh, so here it is. Uh, this is not far from where we stay. You can see this rocky outcropping that is coming right out into the water. There is a sea cave right in here. And on a lark, we, um, our group started working here in 1997. And our goal, in fact, one of our goals was to see if we could find vestiges of the pirates. And so we swam out into this cave and we found cuttings on the walls where clearly ships could be moored. Uh, now, we don't know for certain if this was in fact a pirate moorage or was it at some point later, it certainly could have been. But we know that pirates did occupy this very site. So it's very possible, if not likely, that we did find some evidence of, of pirates inside of this cave. Um, here we go. Now, the pirate menace was ultimately quelled by Pompey the Great, whom I, we just heard speak of here a few minutes ago in our, uh, in our opening talk. Uh, Rome had just been uh, affected way too much by the pirates, and uh, their shipping was threatened. And so they, the Roman Senate had just had enough with the pirates, and so they gave their greatest military leader at the time, um, unprecedented power to quell the pirate menace. And in this great big sweeping motion with his navy, he corralled all of the pirates into this harbor right near where we are in, um, in southern Turkey, today the modern city of Alanya. And here in the harbor is where he destroyed the Silician pirates once and for all. Uh, from now on, from that point on, from 67 on, there was no longer any pirate threat. So, uh, the pirates themselves would be settled among communities in the area. Uh, so that was one of the things that we wanted to do, is see if we can find vestiges of the pirates. 
But we also wanted to un understand what this region, called in antiquity rough Cilicia, what was this province like in antiquity? It was practically unknown by scholars um, um, archaeologically because very few people had traipsed through the countryside looking for archaeological sites, and so that's what we did for 10 years. We walked up and down the, uh, the, the hills, the mountains, the traits, the valleys. I know this thing will work one of these days. There it goes. Uh, you can see how extremely uh, rugged this terrain is. Uh, at the very top of this ridge uh, is a Roman site that, um, while we didn't discover it, we were the first to map it, and it has some of the best surviving antiquities that I have ever seen unrecorded. Whoops. So these are, um, these are Roman walls that are standing oh, more than 75 feet high. Uh, nice fortification walls with a very uh, powerful, with very powerful towers, a gateway, and we've discovered several bath complexes within the overall site, but all of this was unrecorded by archaeologists until we arrived here in 1997. So this was our main purpose, was to try to document the archaeology in this region, see if we can find vestiges of the pirates, uh, and to do so, of course, we had to walk and walk and walk with our heads down, looking for pottery, that would help us determine if this was a site through the scrub, um, through the sticker bushes and everything. It was, uh, it was not easy. This is a, a pair of our pottery walkers looking for the, uh, looking for sites and looking for pottery sherds on the, on the ground that might help us determine if there was a site close by. Uh, my team was the architecture team. We had a little bit different idea on what archaeology uh, should be. Uh, we hung out on the beaches until we were called in. Uh, they, when they found some standing architecture, then we would go to work. Uh, yes, it sort of looks like fun here in the, in the beach. Uh, but, there we go. Sometimes things got a little hairy. This is my colleague, Professor Rice Townsend from Clark University in Massachusetts. Uh, he is documenting a Roman wall 200 meters straight up from a cliff, and he's not doing it with a, uh, with a safety harness on. Um, so things did get a little bit, uh, a little bit hairy sometimes, and especially the area, rough Cilicia, um, is quite rugged. Uh, in order to investigate where many of these sites, we had to actually get to where they were located. Um, usually we were told where, they, where we might find antiquities by local farmers or shepherds, and then we would go up to the, the hills in question. Trying to get through the brush, however, proposed to be a problem. So fortunately, we brought college students with us and armed them with machetes, and that's always a very good thing to do, we discovered, because they will build a nice trail, and we follow right behind them, that's me coming up, and these are college students, as we're blazing a trail to get up to one of these sites that's going to be filled with architecture. Uh, now, of course, we do uncover and encounter some problems, of course, my colleague, Professor Townsend, just whacked his leg. You can't see it because of the slide here. The slide's a little washed out, but he has blood pouring down his leg uh, because of a whack from his machete. So things do get a little dangerous sometimes. Now, um, there you go. I mentioned that the, the scrub here is pretty, uh, pretty dangerous. Almost, almost every single bush has stickers on it that will rip the flesh right off of you. It's pretty nasty. We would often come off the field covered with cuts and, and, um, and blood pouring down and we wouldn't even be allowed into restaurants to eat lunch until they cleaned up. Uh, or if, wasn't, if we weren't cut up by the shrubs, we would encounter horrible spiders that could uh, knock you down pretty easily. 
Uh, it wasn't spiders, it could be vipers like this. We also discovered that the asps that killed Cleopatra came from our region. And yet we still have lots of students wanting to come work with us. Uh, I think the thrill of danger is what lures them to rough Cilicia. Um, of course, when we find architecture, uh, we map it with total station surveying equipment uh, so that we have a pretty accurate record of what we find. Uh, that's me holding the, uh, the, the stadia rod as we're documenting. And as a result, we were able to, we discovered a number of sites. These ranged in size from, uh, from cities to small villages to independent farm stands. Uh, so we now have a pretty good idea of what this part of the Roman Empire looked like in terms of its layout from uh, throughout this area. The perp our original purpose in those 10 years, we were able to answer the questions that we set out with, most of them anyway. But it was, um, but in so doing, we also opened up a bunch of new questions that could only be answered really if we dug in the ground. So that is when we turned to the second phase of our operations back in 2005, and that was excavation. We chose the site of Antiochia at Praga. That's how it's really Antiochia at Praga uh, at the bottom site. This is a, a Google Earth look at the site. Uh, it was beautifully uh, rendered right on the uh, right on the coast. Some of the most spectacular landscape you can imagine. Uh, I'll be showing you for the rest of the evening. I'll be showing you slides of the. Uh, of the site um, and the excavations. The term, or the name, Antiochia ad Pragum, is a Latin term that means Antioch of the Cliffs. Now, I want to say a few words about Antioch and Antiochus, who was the, uh, the, the person after whom the site was named. Many of you have heard of the Antioch in Syria. Uh, perhaps one of the great cities of the ancient world, just behind oh, Rome and Alexandria, then there was Antioch. Uh, and the, the name, the personal name Antiochus was actually a fairly common name. And there were lots and lots of kings named Antiochus in antiquity. Uh, the, the Antiochus, after whom this one was named, was a client king to Rome about the, uh, who lived during the time of Nero, Claudius and Nero. In fact, he was a good friend of, of Nero's. And Nero gave him permission to establish cities in uh, rough Cilicia, and this was one of the cities that he created um, around the year 55, AD 55. And so this is about 125 years after the end of the pirate scourge. So we know that this was a pirate base, and then it seemed to have been abandoned, and then the Roman period city was founded then in the mid first century AD. So that is what we have in the back of our minds as we are excavating. Now this is the harbor of the ancient city. This is from an, a drone view, that's one of our pieces of equipment that we have on the site. So this was the ancient harbor, and we did an underwater survey. In fact, we did two of them. The first one we did in, um, um, in 2000, and uh, we have uh, some views of it. Here it is, here's our, our, uh, uh, our boat coming out of the city of Antalya. This was a Turkish and American team. That are um, that are working together. Uh, first, using side scanning sonar to see if we can locate any kind of wrecks. But what we did find, we didn't find any uh, any preserved wrecks, but we did find objects in the ground. One of the objects we found, in fact, was this bronze uh, fitting for a uh, for a ship timber. 
and it's in the form of the winged horse Pegasus. Uh, we cleaned it up. Here it is. We cleaned it up, and we discovered in cleaning it up that it had still some wood inside of it. And we were able to carbon date the wood, and it turned out to be the second century BC. So we have our smoking gun. We have our first object that almost certainly belonged to the pirates. Uh, because since we know from our sources that this was a pirate base, and now we have a ship from the late Hellenistic period that was in harbor in our, uh, at our site. <coughs> so this is, it's pretty clear that this was a, a piece from a pirate vessel. Now it's on display in the local museum. A very handsome piece um, um, to boot. So we have tried to do, uh, we did another uh, survey. This was uh, three years ago. Um, with a, a uh, we joined forces with a, a another Turkish underwater uh, outfit from uh, Konya University. Uh, this was the first time I ever tried to do scuba diving. But you know, I figured I'd never outgrew the sandbox stage in life, so I wasn't going to be uh, stopped by going underwater. Um, so I strapped on the scuba gear and um, but look at this. You know, I might like to see myself as a Jacques Cousteau like, but, um, but instead I look more like a manatee <laughs> uh, with flippers on. But we did find all sorts of artifacts down in the harbor. Uh, from anchors that you see here, in fact I have several anchors to show. Uh, that we are documenting, and anchors that date from as early as the Neolithic period. So we found Neolithic uh, uh, anchors that date to 3000 BC. Uh, we found a lot of medieval anchors. This one's a medieval anchor. Uh, we found, oops, I went fast, sorry. What did I miss? Yeah, okay. This thing's kind of sensitive. More, more anchors. I'm just showing you a lot of anchors. Uh, found this really nice Roman anchor. This was the best one. Uh, so these anchors would have, of course, just do exactly what anchors do, and that is keep ships from floating away. Uh, so this would have been the hook that would have stuck in the ground and hopefully would have uh, would have hit a rock in order to uh, so as not to move. The stock is the place where the wood was placed. Uh, and we can see where it was bent, so it got stuck in between two stones, was able to be extricated, and so that's why they cut it loose, and so it's remained in the harbor ever since. Uh, so that's a, a pretty neat find. We didn't, when we excavated here, we did not have a permit to collect. We could only record, uh, and so it still remains there. Uh, hopefully the next time we mount an underwater uh, expedition will be able to collect them. We have recorded it where everything is, uh, and so that's our will be a goal for the um, the next time we go underwater. Now, since then, this has become my hobby. I've now become got certified for uh, for scuba, and it's a it's a blast. Right. So um, I'm going to show you now what we have uh, uncovered over the. Uh, the years that we have been excavating. This is a uh, view looking down over the site, and the very first thing you will, whoops, sorry, uh, where am I? There we go. Okay, so the first thing we notice in the foreground is this mound. Um, that is the remains of a temple. Uh, when we came here in 2005, here is an overall view of the ancient site, and, and looking down into the uh, looking down into the uh, the site itself. This is our, the city center of the site, and so let's take a look first at the temple. Oh, forgot I forgot I have these images of our technology. We. We've uh, introduced the use of drones into our research. Uh, this is Ben Primer, uh, who is our drone pilot. He is uh, one of my former students, and he did uh, come excavate with us in 2007. 
And uh, when he re then at, when he was at the university, uh, he became interested in drones, and he uh, then became a, quite adept at drone photography. And since then, he has uh, he has operated his own business out of Mumbai, India, uh, and he is one of the most sought after drone pilots, journalists in the world. Uh, but he always has an affinity for our site, so he comes and spends a week with us every summer, um, either coming from Mumbai or from Africa, where he goes on and uh, documents safaris. Uh, and so the images that we have from his drone work is, are just stupendous, and we're so tickled to have him uh, with us every summer. Uh, right, so, uh, there we go. So here is the, uh, the operation of the drone. In fact, this is the very first day uh, that the drone was in operation in 2012. Uh, the gentleman sitting down is our Turkish representative. All, uh, all excavations, whether they be a foreign excavation or a Turkish excavation, must have a member of the Turkish uh, Ministry of Culture to you know, make sure that we're abiding by best practices uh, and also to act on our behalf in case um, we have a, 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 maybe the police might or the army might harass us or something. They're there to make sure everything is, is okay. Just as we were about to let the drone fly, um, I decided to ask our representative if he knew if there was any restrictions regarding drones um, because, you know, here in the United States there's a great deal of, of restrictions regarding drone use. And he says, yeah, you can't fly over, over 30 meters. And by that time, our drone was like 200 meters up in the air. He said, oh, it doesn't matter. So, <laughs> but he thought it was really cool anyway. So here is the, when we first arrived um, at Antiochia in 2005, we received, we had received a permit from the ministry to begin excavations here. Um, but they wanted us to think about tourism. So we had agreed that in order to get the permit to dig at the site, the very first thing that we would do was a collapsed temple. Now this temple has always been known, um, but it had never been documented except by us. So that we wanted to, we, we were asked to do this first, and then we would have carte blanche to do whatever we wanted to do after that. So this is where we began in June of 2005. And back then, this was just a mound of uh, fallen uh, architectural material covered with uh, thorn bushes. So uh, the very first thing we did was to clear off the thorn bushes. Here's just another view of it so you can see what it looks like. See a few little blocks poking out from underneath the scrub. Uh, and then we cleared it off. Of course, it was done by, uh, by undergraduate students, mainly. Uh, gave them machetes, you know, that's the drill. Of course, they were aided by herds of goats that would come by. And, you know, we thought, huh, they did a pretty good job, those goats. Um, so we thought, gee, should we have goats or should we have students? Uh, uh, the goats don't drink as much beer, uh, but they're not as much fun as the students, so we, keep the, we kept the students. Uh, so we were able to completely uncover the temple from its, uh, from its scrub, leaving behind this mound of fallen material and then uh, we recorded everything, of course, by our total station. There it is. Uh, using color codes to tell us what kind of, uh, what part of the temple the blocks belong to. Like blues, for example, were the column shafts, and uh, the yellows were the doorway, the orange may have been the frieze. And so that helps us understand how it fell when we try the idea is to put it back on paper again. And of course there was a pediment attached to it that had rolled down the hill. And the pediment helped tell us to whom this temple was dedicated. 
Um, we knew from just looking at the style of the sculpture that it probably dated to the end of the second century, early third century AD. And the class of emperors, just go down and look at your displays downstairs, and we'll see that at that time period was the emperor Septimius Severus. And so um, the figure inside of this Clippius, this sort of round uh, sculptural element, um, is the god Apollo. But we know that the family of Septimius Severus, for whom the dynasty, the Severan dynasty, uh, would come from, had a close affinity to the god Apollo. So this temple almost certainly is an imperial temple. In other words, it was involved with the worship of the Roman emperors. First Septimius, his son Caracalla, and the, uh, the rest of the family. Um, so, part, after we had the blocks documented, we then had to move them off the mound. Uh, we enlisted a crane and had to teach the crane operator how to lift um, carefully marble blocks. He used to carry like um, sewer drains, you know, where he doesn't care all that much if he drops it. Uh, in this case, we were very concerned about any kind of accidents that might occur. And so for 650 blocks, we were able to remove it. And this was a, this was a long-term project. It took four years to complete, each one very carefully, um, these marble blocks, each one weighing um, nearly a ton each. Uh, so it was, a, it was a long process to do. Um, and here's, whoops, here's some of our engineers. And this was done by an architectural engineering team from UNL, who was who still is is in charge of the reconstruction um, program for the uh, for the temple, and just more views of the the of the temple in process. This is where we're moving the uh, the pediment. This is uh, Professor Ed J. Erdemush from the Peter Kiewit Institute, who is also Turkish and an expert in historical. Uh, masonry structure. She's the engineer in charge of the um, of the temple reconstruction project. So this took, uh, in fact, two days to accomplish. This is a 10-ton block that we are attempting to move to its um, to its current resting spot in the in our block study field. So this is what it looks like once we got all of the temple, all of the blocks removed off of the mound. Uh, and it was now available for, um, for study and for excavation. <laughs> right, I have to go over here and press the button. So this is what it looked like uh, before excavation. So we started then taking it down and we came across graves. Um, graves in a temple. Well, what happened was, and we found all sorts of grave material including bone fragments and jewelry, stuff that you would expect to find in graves. Now, normally, a, a Roman temple is not going to be a cemetery. But the temple would only be a temple until the time of Constantine. That's when Christianity came on board. And um, this area, this neck of the woods, it's in Cilicia, the home of St. Paul, in fact, who came from just down the, uh, the road a piece in Tarsus. Um, this became a, a hotbed of Christianity. Um, there were several churches constructed here. Um, we are going to start excavating one church, in fact, this coming summer. Uh, and so this temple fell out of use very quickly uh, during the, uh, during the, the post-Constantinian period and it became a good place to put graves down. So these are late Roman graves uh, that we discovered. Uh, and now you can see what it looks like. This was just taken a few years ago, um, completely removed of all of its architectural materials. We now have it waiting below. We also discovered a wine press constructed against the side of this temple. Um, and the idea is, is that we are going to reconstruct this temple as much as possible. 
Of course, we need to come up with a uh, sizable sum of money to do so. But we have all. But our engineering and architecture team is at is at work even today, uh, preparing the plans for the reconstruction of this temple. We know where all the blocks originally were placed, and that's going to be the key part. So once we know where they were, it's just a matter of putting them back up. And the engineering team will be there this summer to assess the viability of putting a temple back up on that spot. So that's our, uh, that's our coming goal. Here's a, a view of the back of the temple. You can see some trenches that we dug in order to find the pottery that would help us date exactly the construction of the temple. And our pottery dates, in fact, did tell us this, this dates to the end of the second, early third century. So we were right. Uh, that's always nice to have verification of um, our original hypotheses. So, uh, you can see on the back um, how handsome of a temple it was. Now, I know it's going to take some imagination to try to put the temple back up to reclaim some of its glory. So that's what I'm going to have to ask you to do, to try to use your imagination to imagine what it was going to look like. Right. Now, I'll show you a little bit something that is perhaps the most extraordinary thing that we found. Uh, this young college student, uh, who comes from Purdue University, uh, happened to be walking in this field near where we believe the, the center of the ancient city was located. Uh, we had just begun to um, excavate up on top of the temple, and he noticed these, um, these furrows that the farmer had plowed. And he noticed that inside one of those furrows there were mosaic fragments coming up. Uh, and so he told us, and so we told the, our representative, of course, now this was before we had permission to excavate everywhere. Uh, so we did not have permission to come down here and excavate, but we were able to document that there was, in fact, a mosaic located at this spot. Uh, and so we had done our due diligence, but two years later, uh, in, uh, 2011, sorry, yeah, 2011, uh, we were able to start clearing. And so we hired our workmen and put them, uh, gave them the task, and they kept digging, and find, they found the mosaic directly just a few centimeters below the surface as we, because we, that's how we noticed it. And they kept clearing and clearing and clearing, and they cleared for two months. Uh, and we found the largest mosaic ever found on the south coast of Turkey. Uh, a fabulous, um, probably 4th century AD mosaic. Um, and this was just after one season, and we only found 40% of it. So uh, we have more to come. Here are some of the details of this mosaic. Now, this is a mosaic that has geometric decoration on it. Unfortunately, it had no figural designs, didn't show any gladiators or uh, any, any human figures. It was just beautiful geometric decoration, complete with these Escher-like patterns, uh, three-dimensional um, uh, 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 spatial elements, which were fascinating to look, uh, to see. So this is what it looked like as we were to begin the next season of excavation. So this is 2012. You can see the area that we still have yet to clear. Uh, and that's what we began to do. If this, there we go. So that's the next season. We're taking it down and sure enough we found the rest of the mosaic. Uh, and we also found a swimming pool in the middle of it, which was way cool. So we're clearing it out here. Uh, and uh, this is what it looked like when we finished uh, clearing everything. Uh, we were able to find steps that led down so that bathers would be able to access the swimming pool. It was, you know, a swimming pool is probably a misnomer. It's really more of a wading pool or a sitting pool because we found a bench down at the bottom where they could, where bathers could just sit and relax and enjoy the cool water with fresh running water into it 
on a hot Turkish day when it temperatures are regularly close to 100 degrees in the normal summer months. So it would have been a very pleasant thing. Now, the rest of the mosaic would have been, uh, or the courtyard, which is what it is. Let me sort of go back to slide. So it would have been covered up with a colonnade so people would have been in the shade, but only in the area where the swimming pool was located would it have been um, in full sun. Now, we were able, let's see if the next slide comes up. There it comes, there's the step leading down. You can see that it had a nice floor of marble. It also had drains. So um, we, of course, are interested in drains. Of course, we're interested in technology. So this was the exit where the water was. There it is. That's where the exit where the water was. We have an, in, uh, an intake flow, a lead pipe, in fact, under here, to allow water to um, flow into the, the pool. So it had constantly running fresh water. Uh, we uh, investigated the drain, because still the drain cover was completely intact. Uh, and that's me with my camera. And first thing we discovered, in fact, was graffiti carved on the side of the drain. Delta, Iota, Delta, uh, which sort of transliterates as did, like I did it. <laughs> of course, that's not right, but <laughs> sorry, funny anyway. So this would have been carved there by the workman or a repairman who was uh, fixing or repairing or making the drain. Fortunately, we had a whole bunch of Hike Challenge students, uh, and so we put them down into the drain, gave them hard hats, and uh, they cleared out the drain, uh, which was very nice, so we can see how the drain actually functioned and how it worked and the networks involved. We also found um, when, because this was a real drain that worked with a, by a sluice gate, that when they opened the sluice, coins came flowing out, flushed out from the, from the pool, and we also found, in fact, a piece of jewelry, a, a solid gold earring that would have cost, I'm sure, a pretty penny to the young girl or the girl who lost it, we assume. But all of those coins, here's a close-up view of this gold earring. So that means, you know, the fact they had coins with them as they went into the water meant they had some clothes on, obviously. Uh, a tunic or a chiton, a uh, toga of some sort. They had money in it, but they would lose it in the, in the water. And then when they drained the water every so often, that those coins came whooshing out into the drain. And we found two, over 200 coins. In the, uh, in the drain. We're still dating them, but the ones that, are, are, that can be read all point to a uh, fourth century date, fourth century AD date, about the time of Constantine. So that would have been about the time of when this thing was, uh, was really finding its, uh, its chief action. Uh, so here's a drone view looking down into the courtyard where this was. Now, this would have been a place that was walled off. You can see the walls quite nicely. Um, who would have been in here? Well, based on the decorational scheme, we, uh, we believe that this would have been for the, uh, the upper class of the, of the town. Uh, the people living in rough Cilicia, um, they were not Romans. I mean, these people are not ethnically Roman. They are ethnically Luvian, Luvian. Uh, and they have what we are able to understand a very distinct class society. So uh, this is probably meant for the higher class um, of, of uh, Antiochia Pragum society with a magnificently large bath complex that it was attached to. And that's what we are currently uh, engaged in clearing out. And we'll take a look at it. Here's a, another drone view. So here is the, uh, the, bath com or the courtyard complex and the bath attached to it. You can see it's only, only partly cleared out. Another courtyard out in the, on, the north, on the south side with a, another temple complex that we discovered and a mosaic. So let's take a look at a couple of these things. 
Uh, here is that other temple with a mosaic inside of it, and you can see that it has a little bit different style of decoration, this time with um, floral decoration. This one, come on. There it is, with very nice floral decoration, pomegranate um, devices, and, uh, and more um, garlands. So it's a very handsome mosaic. Uh, you may be wondering, what do we do with the mosaics? Um, well, we cover them up because we don't want any damage to occur with them until we can uh, erect a pavilion over them. So we place a layer of geotextile covered, uh, which we also cover then with river sand, so it doesn't have any salt on it. Uh, we, in fact, did that because we heard one of our workmen say that he can't wait to get his motorcycle on the mosaic. Uh, it just isn't going to work. So we put this deep layer of sand on it to protect it. Um, but eventually the idea will be that we will erect a tourist pavilion over the mosaic so it will be available for, uh, for view. Um, so now we're excavating the bath, the great bath of the, um, of the city. Uh, Romans always bathed in a sort of a triad way. You go from cold to warm to hot. And then you can go back to the beginning and start over. You can spend hours inside of a bath complex. And baths were extremely popular among the Romans. Um, so, so popular, in fact, that the culture of bathing still exists in Turkey today. Uh, so you go, you go to Turkey in Istanbul, you'll see the hammam. Well, that's a carryover from the, uh, from the traditions left behind by the Roman period. So this is the great bath of, uh, of the city. And we started to work in this large, um, the large hallway that was the cold room. Now, this room itself is about the size of this room. And we're digging it with a shovel. So that's why it does take a while to dig. And when you get down to the bottom, when you get close to the mosaic down below, then you work with a trowel. So it does take a long time to, to clear out. This took a couple years to do. When I say years, I mean two summers uh, working on it. Here's an aerial view looking down. Um, on this uh, this area, and there is a mosaic down there. It's kind of hard to see, but you'll have to trust me. It's an Egyptian lotus design. Uh, again, no figures, unfortunately. But this is where we had just finished this about two years ago. We moved now into the warm room, the tepidarium. Here's uh, where we this um, this was taken this past summer, and you will note that in this back complex, we are finding, in fact, pottery kilns. There's a close-up view of it. Pottery kilns. Now, what are pottery kilns doing in a bath? Well, uh, the bath we discovered dates to the time of foundation of the city. So this is one of the very first things that the people of the city built to celebrate the fact that they were an established Roman city. If we're going to be a Roman city, we've got to have a bath. And a temple. So it was like the two major important things you got to do. So it functioned as a bath for a couple hundred years. But like anything, they're just going to break. And the heating systems broke down. And they, and there were, you know, for a variety of reasons, the purpose of its being a bath ceased. Just like in Lincoln, you know, we have the area of the hay market that, of course, was old warehouses. Well, now they've been repurposed into restaurants and bars. Well, this was repurposed. And it was repurposed into a light industrial center where they where their pottery is being made, and we found a, a glass uh, a glass furnace. There's a view, in fact, and we've discovered that in what in this kiln they're making amphoras like this that are meant to transport wine. Uh, and sure enough, we have a wine press where they're making the wine. So now we're beginning to understand the economy of the site. Um, a lot more. So that's, uh, that's really exciting. Um, that's what it looks like. I took that slide, by the way, just uh, last month when I, was, uh, when I was at the site for another reason. I had to go to Turkey for a week. 
Uh, and we have it covered over so the rains won't affect it, um, which it probably almost certainly will. So we are going to be uh, working more in the warm room. It's going to take, we figure, another five years to clear out the entire bath because it's a huge building. Uh, one of the largest baths, in fact, on the south coast of Turkey. Now, um, my colleague and I were looking over the bath to a, to a site that, um, sorry, I, I ruined the surprise. Um, go back for a second. Um, this, as a Roman city in the Greek East, you would expect to find the place where laws are promulgated, where they're made, the city hall. And the city hall of these cities in the, in the Greek East were called bulletaria, which is council houses. And bulletaria would also, also serve as a place where music could be heard. So it's like a, an odeon. And it's also a place where theater could be performed in small provincial cities. And so we're trying to find a theatrical looking area. And sure enough, we found one right next to our bath, and that's it. You can sort of see through the scrub a curved area. And what, this is what happens six weeks later. Whoops. Like that. Whoops. Sometime. There it is. It's a, uh, we found the, the council house, the Bulletarion. So we were extremely pleased. Uh, one of the, again, one of the nicer discoveries that we've had. Uh, here's an aerial view looking down it. We're still excavating it. This is from this past summer. So we've had this area. We found a fragment of mosaic right here. So we're, we're going to be finding a mosaic when we go back there this summer. Uh, and we've now uncovered 90, well, about 95% of the building. Um, so we can pretty much put it back together in how it would have looked like. We know that it had grandstand seating. Here's the orchestra. So, and the people would have sat on the first row of marble, the speaker's platform here, or the singer's platform. And then the rest would have been, the rest of the people would have sat on um, wooden benches that's supported by these radiating walls. And sure enough, we found a bracket this past summer, there it is, uh, made out of iron. This thing weighs about 20 pounds. And right inside of here, we found a piece of the plank, still intact. So we sent it off for carbon-14 dating. And I just got the results back a couple weeks ago. Um, and it dates to the end of the first century AD. So um, we're right smack, again, one of these buildings that belongs to the early phase of our, um, of our building. Uh, another area of, of interest was a, the commercial area. This is the main gateway into the city. There was a street that ran down the middle. This was a beautiful avenue where, uh, where shops would have been placed. You can see, uh, here's the street itself. We dug a trench to see if we can see if it was paved or not, it wasn't. But we did find fragments of the colonnade and the shops would have been behind. So we excavated so far one shop or two shops. Here's where, where they are. Um, and you can see the shops here, the colonnade out in front. And uh, the columns had fallen directly in front of where they once stood. And so we thought this might be a good idea to re-erect the columns. Uh, and we, uh, we hired a, an artist to sculpt new bases, which the old bases were gone, the granite columns survived. And so we, uh, you can see the bases in process uh, to be made using marble, we think, that came from the, the exact quarry that the original bases came from not too far away. And uh, it was a, a fascinating process this summer, or that summer, this was four years ago, uh, as we were um, getting them prepared. And then the actual erection of the bases took a lot of student labor and our own workmen to put it up, make sure everything was neat and perfect. 
uh, using our architectural engineer to help um, make sure that these things would stand permanently using fiberglass reinforcement rods and then we began to erect them using our crane again uh, and we put them back right smack on the exact same spot they once occupied and uh, the result is fabulous. We have two columns nicely standing in their original spot yet again. Uh, so we're very proud of that, uh, of, this, of this accomplishment. Uh, and a reconstruction of what this colonnade might have looked like back in the day. Um, finally, I just thought I'd bring this up. We also found, it was that same year, in fact, just, uh, four years ago, um, one of our Turkish student teams uh, found a beautiful carved head of the uh, mythological figure Medusa. And here she is in all of her glory. Uh, Medusa, the mythological figure whose snakes coming out emanating from her head were so terrifying to view that it would turn any living thing into stone. Um, of course, if you put Uma Thurman with them, the way that she appears in, uh, in uh, Percy Jackson, so here is what Medusa might have looked like if she were Uma Thurman texting. Uh, anyway, so um, this is where new technology comes in. We have all sorts of these blocks that belong to this architectural element. Uh, yet they're kind of heavy to heft around. So by using this new technology that is called photogrammetry, by photographing the heck out of these blocks, we're able to get three-dimensional views of each block so that we can reconstruct them on paper without actually doing them uh, for real. So this is, this is what a photogrammetry re restored pediment will look like with all the blocks that we found put together again, so you have some understanding of how it would have looked like um, without actually gluing them together. Now eventually we will do so, um, but, for, for, but for now we can do it on paper and it looks really, really nice. So i <laughs> bring this slide in, it shows Medusa taking a nap before we send her ceremoniously off to the museum. Uh, where she will be put on display. Anyway, that's it for my talk. Uh, it's a sort of a sunrise over the Mediterranean. I want to thank you very much for your attention. Thank you for coming to support this wonderful museum. Uh, it really is a treat to see such a great collection in the heart of Nebraska. Your college should be proud. Thank you very much. <laughs>